I trust that all of you had a wonderful Christmas spending time with family, friends, and uh, reflecting on the birth of our Lord and Savior. Now, as we come to our service this morning, we're in a bit of a weird in-between. We had our Advent series. We're going to continue in our Joshua series in a little while, but it's New Year's Eve. So I figured we would do something New Year's Eve themed. Sound good? All right. And as, especially because in January, we're going to be looking forward to, we're going to be talking about vision. We're going to be looking forward to the new year and talking about what Journey is going to do in the new year to fulfill its mission, to make more and better disciples by the gospel for the glory of God. But for today, New Year's Eve, I thought we would reflect on the end of the year and the beginning of a new one. How are we as Christians supposed to see the end of the year? A lot of times, this is the time of year where people are getting together their New Year's resolutions. And I'm sure many of you in this room have New Year's resolutions. Maybe it's starting a new workout routine or reading 100 books in the next year. Um, <laughs> the second one is more my resolution. I think the, it's going to turn out I'm going to buy 100 books and not read all of them. I'm sure many of you in this room might be able to relate with that. But we, we come to this time of year and we think New Year's resolutions, that 2024 is going to be my year. It's going to be the year where I get my life together. And as a result, you might see this on social media, you might see other people posting it, that there's all these different strategies for how to capture the new year, how to make the most of it. Maybe it's time management strategies or something like that. I think what all of this tends to show us is that New Year's Eve and New Year's Day kind of show a strong desire in all of us to get control of our time. For, you've heard the phrase before that time is money, that, that a lot of us like to control our time, make sure that everything goes exactly to plan. And when people interfere with our time, we might tend to get aggressive. How many of y'all have experienced road rage? <laughs> Someone being tardy? A long line at the, at the drive-thru, the wonderful uh, Amazon seven-day shipping when you don't get your package on time. All of these things are t ways that we see that we might lose control of our time and that starts to make us feel insecure, makes us feel out of control. What this shows us is that we've got an illusion, we've got a thought in our heads that we control our time and that when time is out of our control, then we start to get frustrated. We start to throw up our hands and think, how can I get my time back under control? What we're going to see from the scripture today is that time never really was under our control. Time is not something that we own. Time is something that is loaned to us by the creator of the whole universe. It is under his control and not ours. So if you could turn in your Bible to Psalm 90, we're going to be looking at the entirety of the psalm today. I, as I was considering what we could look at in scripture, there's not too many scriptures that speak specifically to the theme of New Year's Eve, like with Christmas. So I figured we would go to Psalm 90, because in Psalm 90, it shows the connection between God's sovereignty over time and how we're supposed to spend time. Lots of times we might be thinking, when we start to think about God and how grand he is, how great he is, that thinking about God in his transcendence, sometimes we might feel that doesn't really apply to my life. Now, if that were true, a lot of the Bible would be useless because lots of the Bible talks about how great and how good and how powerful God is and then makes immediate application to how we're supposed to live as Christians. So rather than trying to think, you know, oh, all this grand thoughts of God, that's not practical. Let's take the direction of Scripture and see about how grand its thoughts of God are and how directly those thoughts are supposed to apply to our lives. So if you could turn to Psalm 90, we're going to be reading the psalm in its entirety in the Word of God. Powerful to save and to sanctify his people reads like this. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever, you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are as but a day, or as but yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. 
For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So, teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. This is the word of the Lord. So the central verse in this passage that kind of takes these grand thoughts of God's sovereignty over time and then applies it to our lives, that verse, the main verse we're going to be looking at today is in verse 12. Teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. If you could know, maybe through some act of sorcery or revelation from God, if you could know right now how many more days you have left, would you take that opportunity? No, maybe some people know. Maybe some people, yes. If you could know how many more days you had left on this earth, when the date, time, second of your death would be, but you had the choice whether to have that knowledge or to not have that knowledge, would you take it? Would you seek to number your days? Verse 12 is a really scary request because Moses is asking God to teach them to know that their days are finite, that they're going to come to an end, that no matter how much work they put in today, no matter how much fun they have in a day, no matter how many plans they have for the future, Moses asks God to teach him and the people of God, to number their days, to think about how their days are finite and that they are going to come to an end. That thought makes us very uncomfortable because we like to think that we've got plenty of time. We've got all the time in the world. But what Scripture is going to show us is that when we start to think those thoughts of time, that we have lots of it, we have all the time in the world, and we are in control of time, we run up against the sovereignty of God and even try to compete with it. So we're going to actually take this verse seriously. We're going to ask God to teach us to number our days. And then we're going to look at Psalm 90 and see how Psalm 90 teaches us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. Why do we do this at New Year's Eve? Well, because we've experienced 365 days this year. We're going to experience 366 days next year with leap year. Happy February 29th when that comes around. So what we're going to learn from Scripture is how Scripture teaches us to number our days because verse 12 tells us that in numbering our days, we get a heart of wisdom. That it's actually foolish and ignorant to ignore that our life is finite, to ignore that our days are going to be numbered. Rather, if we would be humble and recognize that God has given us a certain number of days, more than some people and fewer than others, we'll see that knowing that gains us a heart of wisdom that we might live to the Lord and to his glory more effectively. So we're going to ask God, teach us to number our days. How does Psalm 90 teach us to number our days? First, Psalm 90 teaches us to number our days by teaching us to behold God's lordship over time. Verses 1 through 2 of Psalm 90 says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The first thing that we see in these first couple of verses is that God is transcendent over time. Look at what Moses says in verses 1 and 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Now think about Moses' context. He's leading the people of God out of Egypt into the wilderness towards a promised land. Now, what God had promised the people of Israel was that they would have a dwelling place in a promised land, that God would come to dwell with them, that he would be their God, they would be his people, and that they, even though they had not had a dwelling place, that they were sojourners in foreign lands, even from their father Abraham, that one day they would come to a dwelling place of their own. But as we know the story of Moses, Moses disobeyed God. The first generation of Israel that came out of Egypt disobeyed God. And so they did not go 
to that dwelling place in the promised land. But Moses says in verse 1, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Moses is not saying that, Lord, you will be our dwelling place when we finally get to where we're going. He's not just saying, Lord, you have been our dwelling place ever since Abraham, our father, since you made a promise to him. Moses says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. That God being a refuge for his people does not begin with a single individual. It has been who God has been from the beginning of time. Now, it doesn't just say that, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, but it says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. What Moses is saying is that even though the promised land that they're looking forward to is a great and glorious thing to behold, that's not their ultimate dwelling place. And that the promised land is only a good place if God himself dwells there. So too with us, no matter what good time we're having or good place that we are in, it is only a good, true dwelling place if we are there dwelling with the Lord. And the Lord is living with us. So, the God has been this dwelling place for his people for all generations. It wasn't, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't just brought down to Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or even Moses, but God has been their dwelling place for all generations. And then in verse 2, it takes it a step further. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. What Moses is saying there is that before the mountains were brought forth, now the mountains were signs of things that could not be moved. The nations would rise and fall. Peoples would not rise and fall, but the mountains would remain the same. What Moses is saying is that these mountains that have remained the same before they came into being, before the earth came into being, before the world was created, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That last phrase stretches our conceptions of who God is because we might be tempted to think sometimes that God is bound by time, that God is on our clock, that God sees time the way that we see time. But verse 2 shatters those notions and says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. It's interesting because when it says from everlasting to everlasting, the from, we would think the from is a past time. As if the from is a past time, the to is a future time. But what verse 2 shows us is that the, the past of God, so to speak, is everlasting. Now, for us, when we experience the progression of time, when we want to get to 2024, 2023 has to end. 2023 was not everlasting. 2020 felt everlasting. But 2023, even 2020, was not everlasting. It had to end in order for the new to come. We we're going from 2023 to 2024, and that means that 2023 is ending, 2024 is beginning. But everlasting does not begin. Everlasting also does not end. So God comes, or God is God, from a time that had no beginning and no end to a time that had no beginning and no end, meaning that God doesn't experience time the way we do. God experiences time from everlasting to everlasting, which, strictly speaking, when we read that sentence, we would, if you um, logic experts in here might say, that's a contradiction. You can't go from everlasting, because everlasting doesn't end. You can't go to everlasting, because everlasting doesn't ever begin. But that's the way that the scripture shows how great and grand our God is. That he is God without beginning, without end, without change in the middle. That God is God. He is the I am. When Moses asked God his name, God said, I am who I am. God doesn't depend on time to define him. When we see that God is transcendent over time, time does not define God. God defines time. So to maybe stretch your mind a little bit more, let me ask you this question. How old is God? You might be tempted to say, very old. He's the ancient of days, Daniel tells us. He's from everlasting to everlasting. God is very old. But let me just say, if God is from everlasting to everlasting, if his time, so to speak, does not begin and does not end, God is not old. We call things old that have gone through a long process of time. But God does not go through time. Maybe if I could put it like this, time goes through God. 
The Dutch theologian Herman Bavink put it like this, God, the eternal one, is the only absolute cause of time. In and by itself, time cannot exist or endure. It is a continuous becoming, that means it's changing, and must rest an immutable being. That means that which is without change. Bavink continues, it is God who by his eternal power sustains time, both in its entirety and in each separate moment of it. God pervades time and every moment of time with his eternity. And this is my favorite line. In every second throbs the heartbeat of eternity. Who said theologians can't be poetic? In every second throbs the heartbeat of eternity. When we say that God is transcendent over time, that does not mean that he's locked outside of time. What it means is that God, by his power, is the one who makes every second possible. And he directs it as he pleases. So, that's the first thing that we see about God's lordship over time, that he's transcendent over time, even while he's imminent in every moment of time. But what we're also going to see is that God is sovereign over time, which means not only does, is he the source of time, but he directs time as he pleases. Verses 3 through 6 show us this. When, it says, when God says, you return man to dust and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night, you sweep them away as with a flood. For, for us, a lot of time, a thousand years, seems like a lot of time. A millennium seems like a lot of time. But to God, there is if... It was just yesterday. He sweeps years and days away as a flood. They're like a dream. Have you ever had a dream? This drives me up the wall. Have you ever had a dream and you wake up and it's just on the tip of your tongue and you can barely remember what it was about? And if you do, it seems really, it seemed normal when you were having the dream, but when you wake up and you try to explain it to your spouse or your friend, they'd look at you and say, I've got a number you need to call. You, you got to. <laughs> but to God, time is but a vapor. God sweeps away time as if it is nothing. For us, time might seem like it's going on and on and on, like some of my sermons I trust, but God shows that he directs time as he pleases. He sweeps away time. He begins and ends years. He is the reason why 2023 is coming to a close and 2024 is opening up. To put it a bit tritely, you can only do your New Year's countdown tonight if you're staying up until midnight. I don't know if I'm going to stay up until midnight. We'll see. To put it a bit tritely, you can only do your New Year's countdown because God is doing it too. Only because God is the one who is directing the 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Only because God is the one who is doing that can you do it as an echo. He is the one who sweeps away time. He begins and ends years. And then also, because God is sovereign over time and he directs it as he pleases, time doesn't rule God. He, the way that the psalmist puts it is that grass is renewed in the morning and then withers away in the evening. What we'll see is that over a thousand years, uh, you might see things rise and you might see things fall, but God doesn't rise in the morning and then fade away at night. Over a thousand years, time will direct the rise and fall of kings, presidents, empires, civilizations, governments, countries, major international corporations, worldwide movements, but it will never direct the rise and fall of God himself. So, time doesn't rule God, but also God has the true perspective of time. When we read verses like in verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night, we might think, okay, God has a weird view of time, but it's not the real view of time. Like a thousand years is a thousand years. A thousand years is a long time. Now, yes, God is transcendent. God exists differently than we do, so he views time differently, but he doesn't view time the real way like what we do. But that's not the case. God has the true perspective of time. This is going to be important later on when we talk about something else that God has the true perspective of. But God has the true perspective of time. He is the one who directs it, determines it. He's the one who is the source of time. Therefore, when it says that a thousand days are just like that to God, that's because the thousand years are less real than the God of time himself. So God is sovereign over time, he's transcendent over time, and then finally he's purposeful over time. That means that not only does he transcend time, not only does he direct it as he pleases, but his purpose is what he accomplishes in time. God's not arbitrary in the way that he rolls time out. He appoints events properly. 
God is not hands off when it comes to time. And praise the Lord, because if God were hands off when it came to time, then everything that happened would be dependent on us. Our own salvation would be dependent on us, getting it right at the right time. But because God is purposeful over time, not only did he direct all of the events that came up to this very moment, he has a plan and purpose for all time. And he carried out that plan and purpose for all time at the exact right time. Galatians 4, chapter 4, or Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5 puts it like this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. When we read the story of Jesus or the story of the Bible in general, we might read the story of the Garden of Eden, for example, see that Adam and Eve took from the tree that they were not supposed to eat from and then descended into sin. We might look at that story and think, why didn't God send Jesus then? Why did God let hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years of sin, violence, suffering, mistreatment, oppression, why did God let all of that happen? God could have saved so much time if he just fixed everything right after the Garden of Eden. You see how our lordship over time starts causing us to question who God is, his wisdom, This is why it's important to think big thoughts of God in his direction of time. Because when we start to think we're the ones directing time, we start to think God is doing it wrong. Galatians 4 tells us that when the fullness of time had come, God did not wait a single moment longer or shorter than the exact moment of time that he would send his own son to redeem us. God sent forth Jesus at the exact right time. And not only that was it was him sending Jesus given at the exact right time, but God actually has a plan for all of time. Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 7, puts it like this. In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. Now I'll pause right there. If you've ever wondered, what's God's will for my life? It's coming up. If you've ever wondered, what is God's will for my life? I just wish somebody would tell me God's will for my life. I have a word from God for you today that he's that is going to tell you what God's will for your life is. Now, incidentally, that word of God is not being beamed up from heaven directly to me. It's actually in the word. Verse 8, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. There's that phrase again. And here's the purpose, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. God sent forth Jesus in order to bring unity to all things in all creation, and he does that, Script, verse 7 tells us, through the redemption through his blood. What God is saying here is that God sent forth his son to die for our sins and to raise again from the dead for the purpose of uniting all things in heaven on earth to himself. Have you wished that you could be part of something bigger than yourself? Have you wondered what your purpose is? Have you been waiting for your fullness of time? Scripture is telling us that the fullness, when the fullness of time had come, Jesus sent his son, or God sent his son for sinners. And it is through that sacrifice that those sinners can be forgiven, can be welcomed back into the people of God, and can be united to him. God's purpose is the foundation of all time, of individual events, and of the flow of history. That purpose is to unite all things in Christ. Jesus wasn't an audible or a last-minute change that God called on the field in the middle of time when things went wrong. Jesus was the purpose for the fullness of time, even before the foundation of the world. Here's what that means. Your relationship with God, now this might be a little bit offensive to hear, but your relationship with God does not ultimately depend on your choice. Let me put it differently. When we're talking about your choice, your choices don't ultimately depend on you. Now, that's not free license to go run traffic lights and speed limits later on. But here's what I mean. Your choices do not ultimately depend on you. God is the one, Scripture says, in whom you live, move, and have your being. He is the one who gives you life, breath, and all things. When you start to go through the process of deciding where to go to lunch later on today, you can only decide that because God empowers you to decide and gives you the time to decide. 
Now, that doesn't absolve us of our responsibility to use time well, but it does show us that we are not the ones gaining time. We are not the ones locking time away. We're not the supply of time. God is the supply of time. And what that means is that we must live with a recognition that our purpose in time has to conform to God's purpose in time. That we cannot be in competition with God because in that competition, only one person loses. I'll let you figure out who that is. So first, when we're thinking about how to number our days, remember that's what we're trying to do with Psalm 90. We're asking God to teach us to number our days. We behold first God's lordship over time because he's transcendent, sovereign, and purposeful over time. But then secondly, we beware of God's wrath over your time. What the scripture says in verse 7 is that God ends your life out of wrath. Verse 7 says, we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath we are dismayed. Verses 9 through 11 says, for all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? What that means is that the reason why your life has a limit is God's wrath. Death is not simply a natural process. It is the limit that God's wrath sets on human life. We are not in control of our lives. They begin by God's grace, but they end in God's wrath. Now, you might be tempted to think, where does God's wrath come from? Why is God ending my life? Maybe what I feel like is prematurely. What we see is that God's wrath is directed toward your sin. Let's go back up to verses 7 and 8. We're brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. The wrath of God is directed towards the sin of people. Now, it's interesting because in verse 8, when it talks about our sin being set before God, I think there's an analogy to verse 4. Remember in verse 4, that it says, a thousand years in your sight are as but yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. I think what the psalmist is trying to get at, I think what Moses is trying to get at, is that God has the truly correct view, not only of time, but of your sin. Even your secret sins. So for us, when we see a thousand years, we think that's a long time, but to God, it's just like yesterday. Similarly, when we think of our sin, we might think that it's secret. We might think that because no one knows, it doesn't matter to anybody. We might think because it's not hurting anyone, it doesn't matter to anyone. But Psalm 90, Moses says in Psalm 90 that our sins are laid before the light of God's presence. Now, how bright is God's presence? Is there any shadow that it doesn't dispel? Is there any secret that God's presence doesn't reveal? Is there anything that God doesn't know? No. Even your secret sins are clear as day before God. The things that you do without anybody seeing, and you justify yourself in doing them as if it's a guilty pleasure or something that no one's going to know about, so it's not going to really matter. God sets these sins in the light of his presence, and his wrath is directed towards all of them. We might see a thousand years as a long time, but God truly sees that time as a drop in the bucket. Similarly, we might see our sins as secret and even insignificant, but God pulls our skeletons out of the closet and places them before his throne. Now, God's wrath is always based on two things, his righteousness and your unrighteousness. Romans chapter 2, verse 5 says, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Here's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, that their hard and impenitent heart, the fact that they were sinning and were not repenting of it, they were storing up wrath for themselves on the day when God's righteous judgment would be revealed. God's wrath is God's holy disposition towards sin, which means that whenever God has wrath, it is a righteous wrath and it is a well-directed wrath. Now, we might be um, confused about somebody who gets angry when somebody does something wrong to them or they think somebody did something wrong to them, but that person didn't actually do anything at all. That judgment is misdirected, but God's judgment is never misdirected. God never flies off the handle and loses control. 
God is never triggered in his anger in such a way that he loses control and he engages in too much destruction. He gives more punishment than, this, than is due to the sin. God is never like that. God's wrath is always based on his righteousness and our unrighteousness, and it is God's wrath that brings an end to all of our lives. And here's the crazy thing about it. Verse 11, Moses says, Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? Here's what Moses is saying. Even though God is the grand sovereign over all time, he is the one who is transcendent, sovereign, and purposeful in time. That even though we know that God is Lord over time, even though we know that God is righteous and we are unrighteous, verse 11 tells us even then we ignore God's power. Even then we ignore God's wrath and anger. Even then we don't have any fear of God. It is a terrible thing to fall in the hands of a living God, but it is also a terrible thing to the fall into the hands of the one who is not limited by time. But when we live our life without reference to God's wrath, we pretend that we are masters of our own time. And when we pretend that we are masters of our own time, we deny that God is the one who rules over time. When we live as if our lives will never end, as if we have complete control over time, we deny God's wrath towards us. Now here's a question you might be asking. What about if I am in Jesus? What, if I, what about if I trust in Jesus? Is that statement true that God ends our life out of wrath? The answer to that question, I'm going to say first of all, this is going to be a yes and no answer. We're going to start with the yes answer. Like most things, the answer is yes and no. God does end even the Christian's life in wrath. The reason why is that Romans chapter 3 tells us that the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God, or that might be Romans 6:23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That means that even when Christians die, they are receiving the due wages of their sin. Even when Christians die, that is a consequence of their sin and an expression of God's wrath. But here's the good news for the Christian. For the Christian, death does not truly end life. For the Christian, even though it might seem like God's wrath is bringing their life to an end, it's actually God's love. Even though it's expressed through his wrath, God's love is bringing their life to an end so that they, they might be brought up to see their Savior face to face. When we think about God's wrath, we should never think about that as opposed to God's love. When we start to think like that, then we might start to think that God is sometimes angry with us and sometimes love us. God is sometimes happy with us and sometimes he's really just disappointed and let down by us. That's a dualistic view of God's wrath versus God's love that's not supported by scripture. What the scripture shows us is that even God's wrath is an expression of his fundamental existence as the God who is love. So when you as a Christian think about the end of your life, yes, recognize that your life ends because you are a sinner, but also think about God's great grace in your death. That from the moment you die and you are with the Lord, that all the joys in this life cannot compare to a single second in heaven. And then also all the suffering that you experience in this life cannot compare to the time when our Lord will wipe away every tear from our eyes. For the Christian, death is an expression of God's wrath, but God's wrath is not the end of the story. For the person outside of Christ, unfortunately, God's wrath is the end of the story. If you have walked into this room this morning and you have not trusted in Jesus, if you have not recognized that you are subject to God, if you have tried to live your life based on your own standards, if you have tried to be a master of your own time and not recognize that God's wrath is towards you, God's wrath will end your life. And if you've, if you've not looked to Jesus who drank all of God's wrath for you, then what I'm telling you today is that there is a better life for you. There is forgiveness for you. You are a rebel against the God and King of all time. And if you would just submit to Christ, that wrath towards you will not be the end of the story. So, 
God is transcendent over time. We must behold God's lordship over time. We must beware of God's wrath over our time. And then finally, how do we number our days and gain a heart of wisdom? We beg for God's blessing over our time. What that means is that first, we need to manage our finiteness in light of God's infinity. Verse 12 says, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. It's very interesting the way he puts that. Teach us to number our days. He's not just asking that God would make him humble so that he could see himself rightly. He's asking God to help him number our days. He is asking the one who does not need to number his days to help him number our days. When we number our days, we recognize that we are not everlasting to everlasting like God is. When we ask God to number our days, we recognize he is the infinite sovereign of time and we are not. We submit ourselves in humility to the God and the sovereign of all time. Numbering your days isn't just a good time management strategy. It's a recognition that you aren't the one managing your time ultimately. When you number your days, you confess that you are on the clock and God is not. Now it's good to steward time well. It's good to manage your time in a stewardship sense. God has given it to you. So live your life as if God is in charge and he has delegated time to you so that you may use it to worship him. Now, worship doesn't just mean you're just in church 24-7. That includes setting times for private worship, corporate worship, work, rest, leisure, enjoying God's good gifts and creation, acts of mercy, and any number of all things that honor God as the God of all time. I was thinking about making a joke here because in a sports term, when you call somebody the greatest of all time, you call them the goat. And so I figured the God of all time, God is the true goat. And everybody in the room cringed. <laughs> so first, we manage our finiteness in light of God's infinity. Second, we ask for God's manifested presence in our lives. It's our relationship with God that defines the value of our time. Verse 13 says, Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. What Moses is asking God is that God would show his favor to them so that they would remember God's goodness and God's greatness. Because even if they made it to the promised land, if God's love didn't satisfy them in the morning, it would have been for nothing. It's the presence of God that truly infuses joy. Psalm 16, verse 11 puts it like this. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So what the psalmist is saying is that in the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. So how do I access that presence? We might be tempted to think that, that we do that through a mystical kind of uh, working up our emotions so that we might feel the presence of God. But you don't know the presence of God by your feelings. You know the presence of God by his promise. Isaiah chapter 41, verses 8 through 10, puts it like this. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called you from its farthest corner, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Verse 10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is telling the people of Israel to fear not because he is with them. He is not saying that if you are afraid, that means that you're not having enough faith or that I am not present in your life, that the way that your fear goes away is if I'm present in your life. That's not what God is saying here. God is saying that even though you might be afraid now, I'm still with you. He's not saying that you're afraid right now. You need to get my presence into your life so your fear can go away. He's saying you are afraid right now. I am with you. So don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. I am your God. And the way that we ultimately know that God's presence is with us is because of Christ. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. I think I've read this passage like in half of my sermons. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 says this, Since then we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time 
of need. God's presence is guaranteed to you on the basis of Jesus representing you before God. That you don't earn God's presence. You don't somehow secure God's presence for a short period of time. Just like you don't control time, you don't control God's presence. You can't demand God to come down, but God came down anyways. God came down anyways to live for us, to die for us, to be raised for us, that we might be welcomed into the presence of God. And because of that, we can trust and we cannot be afraid. So therefore, we beg for God's blessing over our time by managing our fight nightness, asking for God's presence, and then finally, submitting our work to the favor of God. Verse 17 says this, let the, or verses 16 through 17 says, let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. What scripture is telling us is that even if we put all of our effort into something, if God does not establish it, it will not be successful. Whatever plans or ambitions that you have in the new year, See to it that you submit those plans and ambitions to God. See to it that you don't leave 2023 without prayerfully considering how God would have you use 2024. Don't make plans without consultation with the Lord in his word and submitting those plans in prayer to him. Because otherwise, you are not asking God to establish the work of your hands and you are depending on a weak, finite human such as yourself rather than the infinite, powerful God of all time. Just as it is at God's wrath that your life is destroyed, it's also at God's favor that your life is established. So, submit your work and all of your efforts to the favor of God. I'm going to ask the band to come back up, and as we conclude, we might see God's grandness over time, how he works out time, how he works out his plans, and we might be confused sometimes. We might be confused why God lets certain things happen, or God waits might, he might feel like he's taking too much time to do something. But when we think about God's rule over time and how mysterious it is to us, I was reminded of a hymn by a man named William Cooper. Now, William Cooper was a man who was greatly, greatly troubled. On six different occasions, he had serious mental breakdowns. He would have nightmares in the middle of the night where he felt like the devil was coming to charge him with death. And there were even a couple of times where he tried to take his own life. But yet, in the midst of all of that despair, in the midst of all of that trouble that he went through, he penned this hymn. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unsearchable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. And ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break. In blessings, yea, blessings, in blessings, and in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The, mu the bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Our time might seem long, painful, labored now, but it is God is working it towards an ultimate end that's beyond our imagination, and that end is fellowship, friendship with God forever in Christ, forgiveness forever in Christ, and joy that death and time can never end. Let's pray and ask God to bless our time together. Bow with me if you would. Father, we thank you that you are Lord of time and we are not. We thank you that you are sovereign and we are not. Lord, we recognize that sometimes we try, or most times, Lord, we try to seize that sovereignty for ourselves. But Lord, we pray that we would recognize that we have no ultimate control. We depend on you. We lean on you. We are desperate for you, Father. So Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in this room who hasn't trusted in Christ, who is trying to be Lord of their own time, Lord, I pray that they would recognize that your wrath is what brings their life to an end and the only way to escape your wrath and to enjoy your love forever is to recognize their disobedience and look at what Jesus has done 
to forgive them of their sins by dying in their place and raising again for their life. We pray that you would bless the rest of our time together that it would be pleasing to you. We pray that you would bless our efforts in 2024, that you would keep us safe, that you would empower us to do your will, and we pray that you would bear fruit through us to the glory of the name of your son, Jesus. And it's in that name that we pray, amen.